Okay. Uh, so my plan here is to do, I don't know, like 30 minutes or so of questions from this homework. So we'll go slowly and carefully through kind of whatever you guys are interested in looking at. Um, if I'm doing something you're not sure about, please stop me and ask. I'd be happy to like re-explain or try to clarify to the best of my abilities. Um, okay with that plan? Okay. Who wants to go first with a question? Colette. 46, you say? Okay. All right. So when I look at 46, what I see is a quadratic because I see both sines and sine squares. Stop talking, please. Do you see that, Colette? Okay. So to solve a quadratic, it needs to be equal to zero. So the first step I'm going to do is get everything onto one side of my equation. And I'm really going to kind of look at this now instead of having these signs in there. I'm just going to replace the signs with y's just because it makes it a little easier to see the factoring. Is it necessary that you do this? No. I'm going to do it here just because it makes, um, makes it a little easier if you have trouble seeing the factoring that's going on. Um, so you're welcome to do this or not. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. So to factor something like this, I'm going to look for two things that multiply to give me positive 5 and add to give me negative 6. What are those two things? Negative 5 and negative 1 would be them. And since the leading coefficient is 1, I can just do the short factoring. If you couldn't find the two numbers that did the factoring, what would you do? Yeah, I just do the quadratic formula, right? Good job. All right. So once we have this factored, I'm going to set each piece equal to 0 and then solve them. But remember, we don't want to solve for x or solve for y. We want it to solve for x, right? So I'm going to resubstitute back in at this point. I know that the y's are really sine x's. So to solve this one, I'll take the sine inverse of 5, and the other one will take the sine inverse of 1. So to do that, I'm going to go to the unit circle and look for the place where the y-coordinate is 5. There isn't any. So this part gives me no solution. I'll go to my second equation. I'll go to my unit circle and look for the places where the y-coordinate is positive 1. That happens at exactly one place, pi over 2. So that's my answer for A. My answer for B, then, all I need to do is slap on a plus 2 pi k. And I have an answer for B. Cool with that, Colette? My answer for C, remember C was asking for things between negative and positive 2 pi. So I know I'm going to have pi over 2, and that will cover the parts from 0 to 2 pi. I have that from A already. What I still need, though, are the parts from negative 2 pi to 0. To find those parts, I'm going to have to find an angle that's coterminal to pi over 2, that's less than pi over 2. So I'm going to subtract 2 pi to get that. So when I subtract 2 pi, I get negative 3 pi over 2. And if I subtract it again, it would be too small now. So those are my two answers for part C. And then for D, we're looking at the interval from pi to 4 pi. So I'm going to have my answer from A, because that's going to cover the 
uh, 0 to 2 pi part of it. And then for the negative pi to 0 part, I'm going to look at my answers, my negative answers from part C to see if I to see if those are answers here. This one's not though. Why not? It's too small, right? Negative 3 pi over 2 is less than negative pi, so I don't actually have any answers on that part. And then I need to worry about the stuff from 2 pi to 4 pi. How do I find those parts? I'm just going to find something coterminal to pi over 2 that's bigger than pi over 2. So I'll add 2 pi. When I do that, I get, oops, I'm in the right spot, 5 pi over 2. And if I were to add 2 pi again, too big. So those are my answers for part D, or just those two. Does that feel okay, Colette? So this one turned out not to be so bad once you got past the factoring part because there was really just one answer in the unit circle you had to work with, so it wasn't, wasn't too much to do there. If you were able to get through the factor, right? But now that you know to look for that, it probably wouldn't have been difficult. Or as difficult, anyways. Who's next? James. 38. So the first thing I notice is that I have sines and cosines in the same problem. Oy. Um, at first glance, it's like, well, the, well how am I going to cancel both of those at the same time? We're not. We're going to start by dividing both sides by cosine squared. Because sine squared over cosine squared is just tangent squared. Remember we did this, we saw this trick in the previous homework set, right? We did something similar there. Okay, so to solve this for x then, the first thing I'd want to do is square root both sides. So that'll give me plus or minus root 3. And then to find the values for x, I'm going to split this up into two separate equations. I'm going to have x over 3 is equal to tan inverse of negative root 3. And then x over 3 is equal to tan inverse of positive root 3. Now I'm going to go to my unit circle and retrieve the values that have where tangent is equal to negative root 3. So I remember that tangent is y over x. So I'm looking for the places where the y coordinate has a square root of 3 in it. So that happens at... Uh, 2 pi over 3, and also then again at 5 pi over 3. Oops, I don't want to write it this way, though. I'm going to do that. And then I'll do the same thing for the square root 3. So again, looking for the places where the y coordinate is the square root of 3, or has the square root of 3 in it, I should say. It's actually square root of 3 over 2. Um, and then 4 pi over 3. Now notice when I did this, I wrote these as the infinite solutions, right? Why am I doing that for this problem when I didn't do it for the previous problem? So the coefficient on my x's is not 1. 
So to solve a problem like that, I think it's usually easiest to start with the infinite solution and then work our way out. But I'm not done with the infinite solution here because I haven't solved for x yet. So each one of these I'm going to multiply both sides by 3. That's my answer for B. All right. So for part A, I need to find the things between 0 and pi. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to each of these equations and I'm going to pick some values of k and see if I can find things that fall in that interval. So when I do that, I'm always going to start with 0 for k. So if I look at this first one, if k is equal to 0, what do I get? 2 pi. That's not in my interval, though. That's too big because I have a parenthesis at the end of the interval rather than a bracket. So I'll try a smaller value of k. Let's try negative 1. What do I get if k is negative 1? I get negative 4 pi. That's too small. So this solution gives me nothing inside of that interval. Okay, so I'll move to the next one. I'll start with k equals 0. What do I get? 5 pi. Too big. Okay, well let's pick something smaller. Let's try k is negative 1. What do I get? Negative 1 pi. Too small. That one doesn't give me anything. All right. I move to this one. Start with k equals 0. What do I get? Pi. That's in the interval. Finally, found an answer inside the interval. What I need to do now is I need to check above and below that answer, though. So if k is negative 1, I get negative 5 pi, that's too small. If k is positive 1, I get 7 pi, that's too big. So the only answer coming from that blue equation is just pi. And now I'll try the last one here. I'll start with k equals 0. When I do that, I get 4 pi, too big. So I'll try negative 1 for k. I get negative 2 pi, too small. So that's the only answer, is just pi. Everyone's okay there? For part, oops, that's not B, that's C. We're going from negative pi over 2 to 2 pi. So definitely pi is on there, right? And we know that all of these, if, um, so that's my stuff for 0 to pi, or 2 pi. But remember, we have to check if it's possible to get just regular 2 pi out of this. Right? Because the difference here is that we have a bracket on the 2 pi as opposed to a parenthesis. And I do remember that I did get 2 pi when I was looking at A specifically when this first equation is equal to 0. I can get 2 pi out of that. Everybody okay there? And then I have to worry about negative 2 pi to 0. So really, I only just need to check the negative values for k here, right? You guys agree with that? To find things that are negative? 
So if k equals negative 1 on the first equation, too small. If k equals negative 1 on the second equation, I get negative pi. If I check further, if I try negative 2 for k, too small. Uh, in the blue equation, if k is negative 1, too small. And in the pink equation here, if k is negative 1, we get negative 2 pi, which is okay because it's a bracket there. And if I do a, you know, if k is negative 2, it's too small. So at this point, I'm done. Everybody okay there? All right, and then my last interval is from negative pi to 4 pi. So I'm going to have my answers for 0 to 2 pi. I'm going to have my answer at exactly 2 pi. I'm going to have my negative pi. I don't have negative 2 pi, right? That's too small. So the last part of this interval I need to worry about is from um, oops, 2 pi to 4 pi. Everybody okay there? So let's go back through. Was there any place I could get a um, 3 pi or 4 pi out of this? Oops, I'm sorry. I don't want 4 pi because I have a parenthesis there. I just want a 3 pi. If I look at any of these equations, can I pick a value of k to get a 3 pi out of there? I can't, can I? It should be easy to see that. So there's nothing that's going to go there. So I just have these three solutions. James, are you okay with what we did there? Okay. Is everybody good with how I'm picking the values of k to check to see if there's things inside that interval? I just start with 0, and if it works, then I check above and below, and if it works for either one of those, then I check a little bit more in either above or below, depending on which one works. If it didn't work for 0, I, it depends if it was too big or too small. If it's too big, I check below. If that doesn't work, you're done, you move on, kind of thing. So I just kind of go systematically through. But that's why I start by getting the infinite solutions first. Is that it helps me to figure out, like, what are the possible solutions. Okay? Should we do another one? we got time to do a couple more. These have been good ones. They've been hard ones. So you've picked definitely thought about some of these because the ones that you've asked about have definitely been challenging ones. Who else has a question from this? We're all done? Okay, that's fine. No big deal. So we do have one more topic in section 5.2. So this is the third day of section 5.2. Uh, probably not next week, because I'd like to spend some good quality time in section 3 also. So that's another probably multiple day um, that we'll spend on that one. So. And then in my plan, the first day next week is a work day to kind of get caught up on these first two sections have been also kind of a lot going on. So, um, I mean, maybe before Thanksgiving, one of those days before Thanksgiving, that week of Thanksgiving break, maybe. If it doesn't work out, then we'll worry about it afterwards. I'm not itching to get it squeezed in. It sounds like everybody else is trying to do that, so... We don't need finals week part one here before Thanksgiving, so. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. So let's look at 
a couple of examples here. Still, the idea is we're solving. We just want to look at some more solving situations that are a little bit unfamiliar still. Um, So let's say we want to solve this equation, tan 2x times sine squared half x is equal to tan 2x on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Anybody got an idea of what we should do here first? Ben. Yeah, so it's tempting to want to do that, right? Here's the issue. What if tan 2x is equal to 0? Can tangent give us 0? Yeah, right? Like the tangent of 0 is 0. So you could be dividing by 0 here by doing that. So we don't want to do that. Is that, you're okay with the reasoning why? It's really tempting to want to do that. But it's a bad idea here. Because you're going to lose, possibly lose solutions. Um, the same idea when we were like solving polynomial equations. You didn't want to divide by x. Um, anybody else with an idea? That's the standard first answer that everybody gives, Ben, so don't feel bad. <laughs> that, that, that's your guess. Is it's everybody's first guess. Yes? Yeah, let's do that. So let's move everything on the same side by subtracting tan 2x from both sides. Now they can't combine because we don't have like terms, but I can get it all on one side. And that's a good first idea. Everybody's okay to hear? What next? Yeah, so similar to Ben's idea of dividing, instead let's factor so we notice there's a greatest common factor of tan 2x. So I can factor that out. And I'm just using a bracket here because I already have all those parentheses rattling around in there. And it just feels a little neater to use a bracket there instead of a parenthesis. You don't need to use a bracket. Parenthesis is fine. Just I'm messy and I'm trying to be neater for you guys. So I use the bracket to make it a little bit more obvious. Everybody's good with this? Now what can we do? Well, I have two things multiplied together that equal zero, right? So what can I do with that? I can just set them both equal to zero, just like we did when we solved polynomials last year, right? Same idea. So the first one, we can just take the tan inverse of both sides. The second one, we'd have to add one and then square root both sides. That square root both sides to get plus or minus one, and then we'd break that into two equations to get one half x is the sine inverse of negative one, and then one half x is the sine inverse of positive one. And now we're going to go to the unit circle. So the places where tan is equal to 0 is the same place where the y coordinate is 0, because tan is y over x, and if I have a fraction with 0 in the numerator, it's 0, right? So that happens at 0 and also at pi.
then for these ones, I'm going to look for the place where sine is equal to negative 1. That's the same place where the y coordinate is negative 1. That happens just one place at 3 pi over 2. And similarly, where sine is positive 1 happens at one place, pi over 2. Notice that I wrote all these answers as infinite solutions. Why did I do that? Why didn't I just leave it as 0 and pi? because I have coefficients on my x, right? So the way to do that is we want to find the infinite solution first, and then we can use those infinite solutions to find the specifics. But we're not done yet because none of these x's are by themselves. So these first two equations, we're going to be dividing both sides by 2. So I get 0 plus pi k, which is just really pi k. And the other one, I'm going to get pi over 2 plus pi k. These next two equations, I'm going to be multiplying both sides by 2. So that's going to give me 3 pi plus 4 pi k, and then pi plus 4 pi k. Right, so far so good. So remember, we want our answer from 0 to 2 pi. So if I look at the first equation, if k is 0, I get 0. That's on my interval. If k is 1, I get pi. That's in my interval. If k is 2, I get 2 pi. That's too big. And then I just need to check real quick if I can get smaller. Obviously, I can't get smaller since 0 is the very beginning of the interval, so I won't even bother. So these two answers came from the first equation. Now I'll move to the second one. If k is 0, I get pi over 2. That's in my interval. If k equals 1, I get 3 pi over 2. That's in my interval. If k is 2, I get too big. If k was negative 1, I am too small. So those two answers come from the second equation. If I look at the third equation, if k is 0, I get 3 pi. That's too big. If k is negative 1, I get negative pi. That's too small. That one gives me exactly nothing. We'll look at the last one now. If k is 0, I get pi. Uh, I've already listed it. I don't need to list it again. If k is 1, I get 5 pi. Too big. If k is negative 1, I get negative 3 pi. Too small. So... That's it. Really, all my answers came from the first two equations. The second one is either duplicates of things I already had, I don't need to list those again, or aren't used at all in that interval. Is everybody okay with how I did that? Okay. Let's do another one. So let's say we want to solve sine squared is equal to sine on the interval from negative 4 pi to 2 pi. What's the first thing we want to do to try to solve that equation? Ooh, 
What if, but what if sine is equal to zero? Yeah, let's subtract it over to the other side. Because we don't want to divide by zero. That would be bad. Okay. Now I can't combine sine squared and sine because they're not like terms. But what can I do? I can factor here, right? Notice there's a greatest common factor of sine x. Everybody's okay there? Okay. What can I do once I've got it in a factored form? Yeah, I can just set each factor equal to zero to solve. So the first one will take the sine inverse of both sides. The second one will add one to both sides and then take the sine inverse. So let's go to our unit circle. Sine is equal to zero whenever the y coordinate is zero. That happens at 0 and pi. And then sine is equal to 1 just once at pi over 2. So those are my answers from 0 to 2 pi, right? Everybody agree with that? However, for this problem, we wanted our answers from negative 4 pi to 2 pi. Well, we definitely got those three. Everybody agree with that? Okay. We got to check that 2 pi, though. If I look at any of these answers, is there an angle coterminal to one of them that is 2 pi? Sure, which one? Zero, right? If I add 2 pi to 0, I get 2 pi. Okay. Now I need to check the stuff from negative 4 pi to 0. So if I look at zero, is there anything coterminal to zero that lies in that interval? Sure there is. If I subtract 2 pi from zero, I get negative 2 pi. That's in the interval. If I subtract 2 pi from that, I get negative 4 pi, which is in the interval because, again, we have a bracket there. And now we're obviously done with zero, right? Let's move over to the pi. Can I find an angle coterminal to pi that lies on the interval between negative 4 pi and zero? Uh, 3 pi is too big because we want negative 4 pi to zero. So you should be subtracting 2 pi. If I do that once, I get negative pi. That's there. And if I do it a second time, I get negative 3 pi. That one's there. If I do it a third time, I get negative 5 pi, and that's too small. Everybody okay with that? All right. Now let's look at pi over 2. Can I find an angle coterminal of pi over 2 that's in the interval from negative 4 pi to 0? Sure. What should I do? Just subtract 2 pi. That'll give me negative 3 pi over 2. That's in there. If I subtract 2 pi again, I get negative 7 pi over 2. That's in there. If I do it again, though, it's too small. So 
there's my answer. What do you guys think? Still just like the previous ones, right? The only trick is there's some sneaky factoring that you might have to do in the beginning. Okay. You think you guys got it? At least enough as much as you want to get it for today? Adam? Sure. All right, well, we'll stop here.